would, open your Bibles with me to Jonah, the book of Jonah, chapter 1. And we are going to read the first three verses of Scripture once again. Amen. Jonah, chapter 1. And we're going to pick it up where we left off last week. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, and he went down into it to go with, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So we've learned that Jonah had a mission. Jonah had a call of God to go to these Ninevites, to this great city of Nineveh. These were the Assyrian people to preach to them a message from God because God knew he was dealing with those Assyrians. He knew that he was already dealing with them and all he needed was a messenger to go give this message so that the people of Nineveh would repent and come to God. We saw that through the story, and even when we saw that last week, of course, we read this in that verse 3, Jonah decided not to obey God, disobeyed God, and his desire was to get as far away from God, and so he chose Tarshish. Tarshish represents a far off, as far as you can get away from God. We showed a map of what that could look like last week. Jonah did want nothing to do with these Assyrian people and didn't want them saved because what we learned last week is that Jonah knew because of his own people and his own Hebrew nation and how they in the northern kingdom was rebellious under the reign of Jeroboam II and how they practiced idol worship. I mean, these people were just, just as wicked as the Assyrians. They were pagan, wicked, wayward, lost. I mean, you, they didn't want nothing to do with God either. But Jonah loved his people. He didn't love the other people. And that's one of the things that God taught us. For those of you that weren't let here last week, we're talking about people, groups, cultures uh, in our today's society. I, I gave some pictures of what that could look like. People that we're uncomfortable to go out to reach, but God loves them. The gay community, the homeless community, the, uh, uh, the, the drug addiction community, the alcoholism those who are sexual perverts or uh, sexual abusers, period. I mean, we, we say, no, they deserve to burn in hell. God loves them. And the list just goes on and on and on. You know, you just think about any people that today we would consider degenerate or, or worthless. God loves them. God loves them. And so Jonah didn't want to go. And God, even though he had a mission for him, Jonah, had, Jonah just knew that God was going to be merciful and show his grace and mercy, and Jonah didn't want that because he knew God was capable of doing that. Jonah saw firsthand, we took you back to 2 Kings last week, Jonah saw firsthand how God can bless even a disobedient people because he's kind, he's loving. And like I said last week, and we'll probably say it again, it doesn't condone our sinfulness to say, well, God must be okay with that. I mean, when you look at that verse 3, and Jonah gets onto this boat, and it just so happens that he has the right amount of money. Whatever that fare was, he says, well, wouldn't you know it? I got it. He wasn't a penny short. But even though there may be things that in our sin, we may think that, hey, things are not so bad. Things are kind of falling into place. I'm seeing that God must be okay with this. He's not. A lot of times he just allows those things to happen because he has, you see, God has a bitter, uh, God sees a bigger picture than you and I see. Amen. Amen. God sees beyond what you and I know and see. Even when we come to the place of, you know, when we're praying, I, I know all of us have loved ones, all of us have people that we know, whether they're relatives or whether they're just friends, acquaintances, but we all know people that are not saved, and we, you know, and we got to remember that God is being patient. We often quote that scripture in Second Peter, 
Because God is being patient. He's slow because he wants people to come to repentance. That's what God's word says, just like us, just like you. Think about, I really believe that this message that we're hearing is that God really wants to show us who we were. And so why should we judge a people when God is simply saying, I'm waiting for them to repent. All I need is for you to love them and just give them my heart so that they can see I love them just like I love you. Amen. And so in 2 Peter 3, 9, let me just quote that once again. It says, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, to, be, to perish, but he wants everyone to repent. Everyone. So, just as much as the Assyrian people, the Ninevites were lost, and they're... They were enemies of God. I, I think that that's why we have to just always remember where do we come from when we were an enemy of God. You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul reminds us that you and I, how, how many can raise their hands that you remember when you were lost and you were just an outright enemy of God? Let me see your hands. Amen. We have a few sanctified people in here, amen? <laughs> You're the ones that say, I ain't raising my hand no matter what, Right? But we were all enemies of God, all of us. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, it says, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Uh, that's all the doing of Jesus, amen. That's everything that Jesus did for us when we were enemies and wicked and wayward of God, yet he saved us and he reconciled us, he redeemed us. And not only that, but he, call, he, he just puts his righteousness over us. Now, now we can be called a holy priesthood. Now we can be called blameless. And he says, and you're above reproach. That's why it's so important for us to live above reproach, to honor the Lord because of what he's done for us, Amen. Romans 5.10 says, For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Thank God uh, He's reconciled me. I, I thank Him every day for saving me. Amen. Because none of us deserved. But Jesus, because of what He's done for us, He said, you're deserving this because of me. Because of me. Not anything I did but everything that he's done. The scriptures that we should memorize, and these are great scriptures for us to be reminded of, like Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. You see, this reminds us, all of us fall short, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you see, there's a way out, and that's why Jesus paid the price. And the way out is through him. Because if we don't choose Jesus, here's what the Bible says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you choose not to receive Christ, if you choose not to be a follower of Jesus, that's your choice, that's your call. But know that the word of God is true. The end result, the payment for a sinful life and a rejection of Jesus Christ is eternal separation from God. These words I just shared with you, this scripture that I just shared with you, that the wages of sin is death, for someone here this morning or someone watching online, if you die without Christ, you'll remember that scripture for all eternity as you are tormented in a place called hell. Later, the lake of fire. You see, God loves us. We just have to turn to him and, and repent of our sin. That's why Jesus Christ is that gift. He is that promise from the very beginning for us to have that gift of eternal life. That's why God sought us out. I'm so glad God found me. I'm so glad Jesus found me. I was lost. You know, sometimes people say, I found Jesus. I found you. You didn't find Jesus. You were lost. Right. You and I were lost. He found us. He sought us out. He went after you. He was the one knocking on your door. 
It's just a matter of whether we opened it or not and opened our heart to him. But he sought us because he wanted to save us, reconcile us, redeem us. That's what I love about the gospel story. It's a great, it's a great story to tell others. Let's, why are we not telling this wonderful story to somebody? Amen. We just keep it to ourselves and just move on. But see, God has a mission for every one of us. He had a mission for Jonah. That's why we're identifying with Jonah. So let's not forget where we come from and what he brought us out of. Amen. So let's just have a heart to say, God, just like the song says, lead me where you want. Like, I love that last song we just sang. I like that. But you see, even though God told Jonah, listen, this is where, I, this is where the turn comes right here. Listen very carefully. Even though God told Jonah to reach these uncivilized, brutal, cruel, wicked people, God had a bigger picture in mind. This is kind of what I, I, I started seeing that. I said, wow. I never, I, you know, I didn't see it before, but I saw it now. That's why I said, you know, I don't know how long we're going to get through Jonah, but every verse I'm seeing is like, wow. So we're not leaving verse 3 today, by the way. Those of you from out of town, or if you're visiting from another church, if you can't be with us, watch online. Amen. Because every, everything in this book has something for us. And what I saw here was this. The bigger picture God had in mind and in his heart was to reconcile Israel. It wasn't just to reach an unsaved people. It was to reach his own people. It was to provoke his own people. And Jonah was the tool that was going to do that. Jonah didn't realize this because Jonah's just caught up in his own world. Jonah's just caught up in his own anger. Jonah's just caught up in his own jealousy. He, he doesn't want nothing to do with reaching out to these uncivilized, brutal people but God had a different, had a bigger picture in mind, and that was to provoke his own, his own people, Israel. Israel was just as sinful. You realize that? You know, Jonah knew how kind God was going to be. Jonah knew how God was going to be merciful and gracious, and he did not want that to... He, Jonah was jealous... Jonah didn't want nothing to do with God doing what he knows God can do. Sometimes we fit into that. You know, I, I don't, we, we don't want to admit it. But sometimes we get angry or jealous. And when I say that, even within the church, because it could be where, um, you know, we come and we, for the most part, a lot of you, we all know each other. You're getting to know each other. And uh, I try to get to know everybody, me and my wife. We try. Sometimes we can't, you know, as the church continues to grow. But here's where we can identify with Jonah because sometimes what happens is that if, give or take on a Sunday morning, you know, sometimes there's just, in my mind, I've got things I've got to take care of with the sound booth, with Kelly and the sound and with Kim. And, and sometimes I'll shake a few hands, but I might not shake some hands. And believe it or not, there can be those that say, wow, he used to shake my hand. And now he just kind of just passes me by. He used to take time and sit down right next to me and talk and Tell me how my day went or my week went. Now he just kind of avoids me. Just walks real fast like if he has got something on his mind. He ain't got nothing on his mind. He don't do nothing around here. <laughs> I can't believe it. He's talking to that new family again. He, a matter of fact... He invited him out to lunch. I can't believe it. He's never told us we can go to lunch. You see, you see how the anger and the jealousy begins to come up? And you know, I don't do those things intentionally just to get you angry. But it provokes you. 
It provokes you. This is what was happening with the bigger picture. Jonah didn't realize that, but it was provoking him. And it was provoking Israel. Because God's simply saying, hey, I want to touch those people. I want to spend time with, I want them to know me. You see, when you look at that, and it, it just ties in together, because when you look at the story of the prodigal son, the two brothers, they get their inheritance. One decides he's going to leave home. He takes his inheritance, and he spends it all wayward. He goes into a far-off country, and he just spends it all on wild living. And, and we know that he even spent it on wild living, even with harlotry. The brother makes sure that dad knows that when the brother comes back and he hears he says, what's this I hear? They, I hear that they killed the fatted calf for my brother. Uh, I hear that you're having a party for him and you're just having this great old celebration. The father's all rejoicing because his son that was once dead is now alive, is lost, now he's found. You know, the dad is just excited. You, you get this parable? But the brother is angry and the brother's jealous. And he tells his dad, he says, I don't understand something. I've been with you and you've never thrown me a party. You've never killed the fatted calf. You, you hear what I'm saying? See, the brother represented the church. I mean, even though it represented Israel, it could represent the church. And sometimes we allow anger and jealousy to kind of get in us and wonder why are other people, especially if they're new, they seem to be getting treated with this royal treatment by the leadership or by some other. And I've been here for months, if not years, and I don't get that kind of treatment. You see what we're talking about? This is why we can easily identify with Jonah. And this is wrong. This is, what I, this is really what God is trying to say is that he wanted to provoke Israel because not only did he want a wicked nation to repent, he wanted his own people to repent. They were just as much in sin as the Assyrians were. He wanted to provoke them to, to show Jonah, hey, I want you guys, I, I love you too, but you guys are wayward as well. See, everything God does is to bring us closer to him. You may not understand that because some may say, well, why is God allowing these things in my life? Why did God allow me to experience this in my life? I'm, st I'm still young. Why did God allow this to happen, this tragedy to take place of a loss of a loved one in my life? You see, God allows these things to provoke us, to bring us closer to him, not to get angry with him and say, it's your fault, God. Why are you allowing this in my life? No, it's to provoke us to get closer to him. You see, the end result is that God wants to spend eternity with us. The Lord wants to spend eternity with us. So the temporal, the temporal things, that, the, the, the temporal adversities that we go through in life are only temporary. He has a bigger picture in mind. There's eternity in mind. You see, for us, 100 years is a long time. And, and God help us if we can live to be 100 years. Some say, I don't even want to live that long. Amen. Right? Especially if I don't have my full functions. That's like, no, I don't want nobody taking care of me. Just take me home, Lord Jesus. Amen. So to us, like a hundred years seems like a long time, but to God, it's just a moment. It's, 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 because with God, the bigger picture is there's eternity and the balance. And God wants, and he will allow us to go through adversities in life in order for us just to draw us closer to him. That's, that's his love. When you look at the book of Revelation and you see all the, the, the judgments and the unleashing of God's wrath during the time of the tribulation, some may say, oh man, God's a cruel God. Look at me, read it. And you say, how can God allow that? It's because he loves them. He's hoping that through all of this, that they'll come to realize, okay, God, I give up. Please forgive me. And then there it is. Eternity is more important to God than the temporal troubles that we experience in life. So to, to, to Jonah, Jonah didn't see this, but God's seen this bigger picture. Are you with me this morning? Yes. And so when we look at this, all he wants is Israel to be provoked so that they can come to know him. Listen, I, I'm going to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Are you guys following with me? Yes. Deuteronomy chapter 32, beginning at verse 15. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. Now, Jeshurun is a poetic name for Israel. So, so just, just put Israel in your mind. 
But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat. You grew thick. You are obese. And then he forsook God who made him and scornful, scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy for, with foreign gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God. To gods they did not know. To new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. Of the rock who begot you, you are unmindful and for, have forgotten the God who fathered you. And when the Lord saw it, he spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they, will, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faith. They have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. But I will provoke them to jealousy but by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. We'll just stop right there. So here God is simply saying, listen, I'm going to provoke you. You think you're provoking me? I'm going to provoke you with a jealousy that you're going to see me do what I can do for other nations, and you're going to say, why are you doing that, God? Because you see, the Israelites was God's people. But God provoked them to jealousy. Now, this is the thing I'm going to share with you is that there is good jealousy and there's bad jealousy. I'm speaking about a good jealousy, a jealousy that I'm going to show you that is okay to have. You see, in the English language, when we think about our English language of jealousy, we think of jealousy as a bad thing. And it is a bad thing when it's the wrong kind of jealousy. But when we look at the jealousy that we're going to see here in the Old Testament and the New Testament then we're going to see, you know what? That's the kind of jealousy that God's okay with. Obviously, God has to be okay with it because he says, I'm going to show you my jealousy. See, so we know that that can't be a jealousy that's evil. We know that that can't be a jealousy that's wrong because this word jealousy in the Hebrew, listen very carefully because there's two words I'm going to teach you here this morning. And this word for jealousy in the Hebrew is kana. Kana. It's spelled Q-A-N-A, kana. And this is what it means. To be jealous and filled with zeal, to be passionate, highly possessive. Let me repeat that one more time. Jealousy, kana. To be zealous, filled with zeal, to be passionate, highly possessive. Now that you kind of idea that, you see, this is the kind of jealousy God has toward us. God wants to be passionate toward us. God is zealous toward us, filled with zeal, highly possessive. You see, and, and when I, as I begin to share this with you, I want you to understand that this kind of jealousy that comes from God is good. In Zechariah, let me go to Zechariah. Are you guys okay with me as we go through the Word of God? Zechariah chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Listen what it says. Again, the Word of the Lord came... Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous, Kana. I am zealous for Zion with great zeal, with great fervor, I am zealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem. All of us that are old say amen. amen. I love sitting down. <laughs> Can't wait till we get to heaven. Amen. It says that they're going to sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with his own staff in his hand because of great age. Amen. The streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. Thus says the Lord... It is marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days. Will it also be marvelous in my eyes, says the Lord of hosts? Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. I will bring them back, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people. I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. You see, God, now this can be the future. But what God is simply saying, he's saying, I am jealous for you. I am zealous for you. 
I, I have so much that I want to do for you, so much that I want you to enjoy. This is that word, kana. It's a good jealousy. Amen. And you see, when we look at the story of Jonah, Jonah, he doesn't see this bigger picture. He's trying to provoke Israel because he wants Israel to know. We just read it. I'm jealous for you. I'm zealous for you, Israel. But you're going to have to do repentance. God wants to bring Israel back to repentance. So he's, he says, I'm jealous. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, Romans 10, 19 here's what the apostle paul says i will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation i will move you to anger by a foolish nation it's kind of paul repeating what we just read even in the old testament there's that word in the new testament zealous jealousy zealous is the same root word where we get this word zeal the kana this is a good jealousy in romans chapter 11 verse 11 let me just turn there real quick romans 11 11 I hope you're writing these down. If you're not, go back and, and uh, take time to write these scriptures down. Do your own study. Amen. Romans 11, 11. Here's what he says. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Now, this is Paul speaking to the Gentile Christians. Make sure you understand that. He's speaking to Gentile Christians. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? He's speaking about Israel. Certainly not. But through their fall, this is speaking about Israel, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. You see, the, you see, the bigger picture that God saw since the Old Testament, whether it's in Jonah or anybody in the past, and I'm going to take it even further back than Jonah, what God saw is that God not only wanted to reconcile or to show his jealousy toward Israel, but he wanted to also show it to the Gentile people. Now, Jonah didn't see this bigger picture, but as we have the unfolding of God's word, we can see the bigger picture. Somebody say amen. Yeah. So God has always wanted to save the Gentiles, but he used the Israel, he used the Hebrew nation to be that conduit. He used the Hebrew nation to be the tool to reach the Gentiles. Are you following with me? Yeah. Now, Jesus also... Jesus, there's a powerful verse of scripture that when Jesus, uh, he goes into the synagogue and he opens up the scroll of Isaiah, and as he begins to read this scroll, you guys are very familiar with this, you know, when he says that the spirit of the Lord is upon me, he has anointed me to preach the God. You, you remember that? Yeah. You remember that? Sometimes we just read that and it just reminds us of, you know, Jesus coming on the scene, he's opening up ministry, I mean, he's going to get started sharing his, the good word, the word of the kingdom, Right? But what he says right after that is really powerful that ties into what we're talking about this morning. So I'm going to go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Are you guys with me still? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to move quickly so that I don't lose you. In Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 16. Let's, let's read this because I want you to see the context of what he's saying here. And so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Do you realize that as we just read that right now, that that applies to every race and nationality in the world? It wasn't exclusive just for Israel. It was for everyone. It was so that everyone knew what that mission was that Jesus had, and that was to set all men free. Then he closed the book. And he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, 
You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. You see, he knew in their hearts they did not accept him for who he was and where he came. He knew that in his heart they did not, let me repeat that, they did not accept him. They rejected him. You guys got that? And then he says, Surely, you, I say to you, a prophet is accepted in his own, no prophet is accepted in his own town. That shows you. He wasn't accepted. Now listen very carefully. This is really interesting. I never put it together until now. But I tell you, you see, Jesus is continuing the narrative. The, he's continuing the context of this message of, I came to reach everyone. But I tell you, Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah. Many widows were in Israel. Where? Where? Good. Israel. Let's make sure we understand that. When the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land, but to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. This woman that was a widow in Zarephath was a Gentile. Isn't it interesting that even when, way back in the ancient times that God was wanting Israel to see the bigger picture that it's not all about you, Israel, you're my people, I have called you, but it's not all about you. There is a greater need, and I'm sending Elijah to this woman, widow, and you guys know the story. She was about to die. She only had enough food or flour to make maybe just one last meal, enough oil to make one last meal, and Elijah comes onto the scene to a Gentile woman and says to her, Woman, go make me a cake. And the woman probably thought, Man, I don't have enough for me and my son, and you want me to make you? She, but she obeyed. There's a whole story in that. She obeyed. She goes and makes the cake for Elijah. She gets, she's thinking that this is my last meal for my son and myself, but a miracle happened. The oil never ran out. And the flower never ran out. And she continued to live. God showed his faithfulness to a Gentile woman through the prophet Elijah. Didn't send him to Israel. Send him to Sidon. Send him to the Gentile nation. Zarephath. And then Jesus goes on to one more story. And he says, And many lepers, verse 27, And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha. Now Elisha was the successor of Elijah. He was the prophet that followed Elijah. And so Elisha, the prophet, he's now on the scene, and it says here that many lepers were in where? Are you guys reading their Bible? It's on the screen, right? All these lepers were in Israel in the time of Elijah the prophet. And none of them was cleansed except who? Naaman. Where was Naaman from? Syria. Syria is a Gentile nation. God reaches out to those you may not realize just to provoke us. Just to just cause us to be jealous for him. He's showing us his jealousy. This is a good jealousy. Kana. This is a good jealousy. So, so do you guys see, and now, now some may say, okay, so is that the end of the story? No, this is not the end of the story. Because look at what it says in verse 28. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they were filled with joy. 
It says, when they heard Jesus tell these stories, they were filled with wrath, and they rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff, but then passing through the midst of them, Jesus always gets away. Amen. So, well, at least he did this time. Amen. So here's the story. The Jews were selfish. They were jealous with the wrong jealousy. Jonah was jealous with the wrong... He, he had the wrong jealousy, and that's what made him anger, angry. We've got to be careful, gang, because there's a good jealousy, and the jealousy is... And, 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 and you know, if I want to just try to make it really simple, because we're looking at this bigger picture, there's three kinds of jealousies, amen? And these three kinds of jealousies... Um, Two of them are good. And, and, and the reason why I say this is because I've already taken you to Scripture. I was going to take you to some more, but you know what? I'm just going to move forward here. But there's three kinds of jealousies, and two of them are good. The first kind of jealousy is the jealousy that God has toward man. Now listen very carefully. It was God who said in the Ten Commandments, you, you guys, in, in, in Exodus 20, verse 3, it says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not... Uh, you remember he says that? You shall have no other gods. And then in verse 5, he says... You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. There's that Hebrew word, kana. And then after, of course, through their disobedience, and you know Moses, he breaks the tablets and the, and the earth swallows up all those that are rebellious and, and revelry. But anyway, God gives, no, uh, gives Moses a second set of tablets. And in the second set of tablets, is, you know, in that verse 14 of Exodus 34, 14, here's what it says. For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, listen to what it says, for the Lord, whose name is what? Jealous. jealous. Is a jealous God. There's that word again, kana. The Lord, whose name is jealous. You see, this is a good jealousy. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. You see, when we look at these scriptures, we see that this jealousy, this zealous is passionate, highly possessive. This is what I'm telling you. It's all about you. It's God saying, I am zealous for you. I am doing this for you. It's not for me. It's for the benefit of you. You got it? This is a good jealousy that God has toward us. But the second good jealousy is the jealousy or the zealousness because zealous and jealous come from the same root word. You can do a word study yourself. It's kana. It's a good, it's a passionate, it's a committed type of possessive. And, and, and so for us to be zealous or jealous for God is a good thing. It's to say, God, you're zealous or jealous for me. I want to be jealous for you, toward you. It's like there ain't going to be nobody else that's going to get into this relationship. It's us. Because you love me so much, and my love for you, I want it to grow that much more. I don't want anybody else. I don't want to be an adulteress and allow anybody else into this relationship. I'm not going to let the devil or do anything or the demons of hell try to entice me. I'm focused on you, God. You're my lover. That's why the Song of Solomon is so... You know, if we read the Song of Solomon, sometimes they relate it to a marriage. It's, it's God and us together. It's a relationship. It's the love, the, the love between lovers. God is my lover. I am his lover. God is jealous for me, and he's jealous for you. Zealous for you. You guys understand that? I think I can make that... I, I, that's, that makes it really clear. But here, here's, here's to kind of help you out. There is one verse in Song of Solomon. I, I don't know whether I was going to read this to you, but this is great. It, it really describes it. In Song of Solomon, uh, verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 6, it says, Jealousy as cruel as the grave, its flames as flames of fire. I mean, we're talking about a burning passion, amen, that God has toward us. But let me talk about that second jealousy of our jealousy toward God. In Numbers, chapter 25, Um, do I have time to read it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
I think I can read it. Numbers. You know what? I'm not going to read it. <laughs> Let me just tell you what it is. Israel was, Israel was just being awful toward God. Matter of fact, they were allowing harlotry to happen. And they were open about it. And God was angry. Moses said, Moses was calling, and he was telling, he says, you know, this is wrong. And, and God was telling Moses, I want you to stop this. And there was one guy that rose up. You guys can read it later. It is Numbers chapter 25. Don't read it now. One guy rose up. Because somebody within the Israelites said, you know what? I'm going to do this. I don't care who watches. He gets a woman, and he starts committing harlotry with her. A man by the name of Phinehas, he rises up, and he sees what's happening. This is open. And he says, no, no, no. The Bible says in these verses that Phinehas had a zealous toward God, a jealousy toward God. He took a spear, and he drove that spear in the act of their sinfulness, of their intimacy. He drove a spear. I don't know whether they were in intimacy or whether they were just hugging or standing together. I don't know what these couple were doing, but they were sinful and before the eyes of God. Phinehas took a spear, and he thrust that spear. I don't know whether he thrust that spear while they were hugging or whether they were lying, laying, uh, <laughs> laying. And he thrust that spear through both of them, through the man and the woman, to kill him. You know what God said? God honored him. God said, man, I like that zeal. That's a zeal for me. You see, there's a good zeal and a good jealousy that we can have toward God that we don't allow sin within our lives and sin within those around us, that we encourage them. And so when we look at these goods, when we look at this, and you know Jesus, I remember when Jesus, you guys know the account when Jesus cleared the temple from all the money changers, and, and he was flipping tables, and he had a whip, and he's, get out of here, you guys are not, you turned in the house of prayer into a den of thieves. Remember that? Yeah. And then his disciples, the Bible says that his disciples said, they remembered what the word said, and mm -hmm. zeal for my house. And that's taken out of Psalm 69. But it says, zeal for your house has eaten me up. They remembered that. They remembered that. Written in Psalm, and Jesus fulfilled that. And so there is a good jealousy, but there's a bad jealousy, and that's the jealousy that's wrong. So I'm going to try to land this plane. Let's end it. The jealousy that's wrong, obviously, is the jealousy that we have toward man. And the jealousy we have toward man is the kind of jealousy that also falls into the category of envy. It's the jealousy that says, why do they have to have that? I want that. Why do they have to get blessed? What's wrong with me? You see, there's a wrong jealousy. It's not a jealousy toward God, and it's not God's jealousy toward us, but it's a jealousy that's selfish. It's a jealousy that's self-centered. It's a jealousy that will tear you up and destroy you. It's a jealousy that is evil, it's a jealousy that's wrong, and envy is a part of that. Those are the acts of the flesh. Those are the sins of the flesh. Now, that jealousy, because in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30, it says, A sound heart is life to the body, but envy, and the root word of envy, the Hebrew word there is kinna, not kana, kinna. Q-I-N-A-H. Kinnah. And this is the kind of jealousy that will destroy you, that will eat you up, that will cause you to be bitter and ugly. This is a jealousy of the flesh. This is not a jealousy that God honors. This is a jealousy that we've got to keep in check. This is the jealousy that Jonah had. I don't want to... I, 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 wait a minute. The glory is for Israel, not for them. The glory is for me, God, not for him or her. That's the wrong jealousy. So you see, when you look at the good jealousy, the jealousy we should have is it's glory for God. But whenever we center it and focus it on us and it's glory for me, that's wrong. That's why God had to work in a bigger picture for Jonah to see because he wanted to provoke Israel to repentance. Jonah didn't see it. 
sometimes things happen in our lives so that he can provoke us to come back and realize, God, I'm sorry, because I got off track. I'm misaligned. I don't know what happened. I don't know where I allowed this to come into my life. But God, I'm asking you to forgive me. And this is why we're here today. This is what's neat about being in church is to be instructed by God's word and be corrected by God's word. And God's correction, God's correction is because he loves us. You see, it's not all about me. Man's jealousy is all about me, but God's jealousy is all about us, him toward us, amen? And sure enough, when you look at the book of Jonah and you read chapter four, God, sure, God forgave the, Israel, uh, the Assyrians. God reconciled them, and that's what we love about that. And in Romans chapter 11, and I'm going to just read just a couple of verses of Scripture. Well, Paul writes to the Christians in Rome, and he, and he lets them know that, you know, I'm not going to read it right now. It's in Romans chapter 11. You know, these are good chapters to read, you guys. What I do want to read is in Ephesians chapter 3. So let me conclude here with this. Ephesians chapter 3 says, When I think of all of this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles, assuming by the way that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. And as you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. You see, God has a bigger picture, a bigger plan. God did not reveal it to the previous generations, but now by His Spirit, He has revealed it to His holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan. Listen to the plan, because this plan was in place even from the time of Jonah. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches, in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving Him by spreading this good news. Though I am least deserving of all people, He graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into the God's presence. So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I am suffering for you so you should feel honored. When I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth, and I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, listen, May you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep His love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand, to understand fully, you will be made complete with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through His mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we may, might ask or think. Glory to Him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let's all stand. Amen. Isn't that awesome to think that God had a plan from the very beginning and the plan has always been to reconcile all people, all nations. And so now we see that Jonah, as we sometimes can fit into his MO, 
We got to see the bigger picture. It's not all about us. It's not all about us. I want to encourage you to open up your hearts. And one way we open up our hearts is to one another. You see, can I share this? It's nice to be invited over to somebody's home for dinner or just for fellowship, for a piece of pie and coffee. It's nice to get an invitation by somebody by phone or text and say, hey, come on over. Let's have a burger. Let's barbecue. Hey, come on over for a piece of pie and coffee. It's wonderful to get those invitations. But you know what's even more wonderful? Is for you to give it. Because you see, when we look at this full picture, God is simply saying to us, let's not stay in our own little world like Jonah. Let's not think that it's only for me and the people that I'm comfortable with. God is simply saying, no, there's a bigger picture. I want them to get closer to me as well. And you can be that vessel. You can be that instrument of grace and mercy. You can be that vessel of kindness and love. So I challenge us today to, number one, have a godly jealousy, just like Paul talked about. A jealousy that says, God, I love you and I want you, and God is simply saying that back to you. But then can we do what we said and what Jesus says is, let's just love one another and open up our hearts. And one way of opening up our hearts is opening up our homes. Lord, thank you. I pray, God, that as we can see the bigger picture, Father, that we can just know that it's not about just about me and what involves my world. Help me, Lord, to see things through your eyes. Help me not to be jealous because I have seem to have been forgotten in this church. I seem to have been forgotten by family. Lord, take me to that place where I go deeper with you so that I can reach my life into the lives of other people and open up my heart to them so that I can see, Lord, your heart being revealed for all nations, all peoples, that I have a godly jealousy for you and for others in the right sense. So, Lord, we ask you this morning to forgive us where we may have identified with Jonah. Forgive us, Lord, for a wrong anger and jealousy because we've just been so selfish and self-centered that it's all about me. I'm sorry. I pray that, Lord, we can have that heart to simply receive your forgiveness this morning and receive that joy that, God, to know that you love us so unconditionally, so that, as it says here in Ephesians, how high, how long, how wide, how deep is your love for me. I'm amazed. I love you so much. Can you let the Lord know that you love him this morning? Can you just offer your heart up to him and just say, Lord, I love you. And I receive your forgiveness this morning. And Lord, fill us with your love. Your love is so amazing. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.